Uh, so as, as Alan said, my name's Tom Ovenden, uh, and uh, I'll give a little bit of brief background, although I think Alan's done a fairly good job of summarising these first few slides for me, so I'll try and whiz through them. But So I started my life out not particularly uh, in academic circles whatsoever, but as an intelligence analyst uh, in the private sector for a counter-fraud team. Um, so about as far away from uh, academia and uh, sort of ecology as you might want to start. This is probably the only time I ever wore a tie in my life as well. Uh, then, as I said, moved to New Zealand and possibly the most peculiar job I ever had in my life was um, hunting invasive butterfly species for, as Alan mentioned, the Department of Conservation. Um, and, but that really kind of kicked off my conservation career and Hander Island was where I really got involved with the Scottish Wildlife Trust. And uh, I'm hugely biased, but if any of you ever get the opportunity to go up there, I thoroughly encourage you to do so. Uh, any of you that's already been will know what I'm talking about when it's probably the jewel in the crown of the Special Wildlife Trust Reserves. Again, not biased. Um, that's kind of while I was on Panda is where I really discovered this interest in applied research. And now uh, what I mean by applied research is taking real world problems and trying to use science to resolve those problems uh, by answering, answering them using sort of you know, hypothesis testing. Um, and that kind of led me to want to do my master's and that's where I'm going to be talking to you a lot about um, some of the work that I did during my master's. That's where I sort of did all this research on links at Bang University. Um, and we eventually got this published and my hope is that it can now be used in an applied sense to inform effective decision making on this uh, arguably fairly polarised subject uh, in the future. Uh, and now, as uh, again, as Alan said, I'm a forest scientist, currently do my PhD at Stirling. But, Enough of the repetition of my background. I know this is what everybody's here to, to hear about a little bit this evening. Um, this amazing species, the Eurasian lynx, previously uh, existed in the UK, but uh, alas, no more. Um, and what I hope to sort of do today is pick apart some of the uh, sort of the controversies around the topic, talk about uh, a lot of the real research that we've been doing, um, to sort of whether it's sort of feasible to reintroduce it or not. And hopefully we'll get an interesting spirited debate at the end. Um, and so I think with all these kind of sort of slightly polarised topics, just having a chat about it is probably the best place you can start. And so just as a bit of a roadmap for tonight's talk, I'll try and provide a little bit of context. Uh, and then I'll sort of dig into some of the arguments for and against, and I'll, I'll do my best to provide a, both a balanced uh, argument of the arguments on both sides of the equation, um, but also try to give uh, some sort of information feeding into why people are arguing for particular sides of the coin. Then unashamedly, unashamedly, I'm going to be presenting to you some science this evening and I hope you'll all join me on that sort of voyage of discovery. It's my job to try and make the science uh, as accessible as possible to you and that means you're trying to use sort of accessible language but without missing out some of the real key and interesting details that I think make the science so interesting and make it so robust. So this is very much going to be a science focused talk. Um, and then at the end, I hope we can kind of bring it all together and consider some of the evidence and ask those really difficult questions about whether we should or shouldn't reintroduce links to, um, to Scotland and maybe the wider UK. Uh, and then we can have a sort of a question and answer session. I'll happily field any questions at the end. So starting at the very bottom, I suppose, so what, what is a link? Um, seems like a, a, an easy question to answer in some respects, but sometimes it's worth knowing a little bit more about the sort of ecology and the behavior of the species that we're talking about. And so lynx are solitary forest dwelling cats. And by that, I mean, they tend to live in the forest. They require um, uh, the, the forest for all stages of their life, really. They are uh, effectively small, sort of medium-sized dog. It says 12 to 45 kilos here. That was I actually found evidence for that in some of the literature, but I think that must be an absolute top-end estimate. Uh, I don't know that they ever really reached that size. It may have been an outlier. And they grow up to maybe 1.3 meters long. And crucially, they're an ambush predator uh, that specializes in hunting roe deer. And when I say specialists, I really mean a specialist. They are incredibly well adapted to hunting this particular species of deer that we have in abundance here in Scotland and the wider UK. And critically by an ambush predator, they, they really require cover to hunt. And so they launch most of their attacks from generally within 50 meters of the prey at the point where they sort of launch the attack, so to speak. And that means that they need cover, which sort of ties into this idea of them being a really a forest dwelling species. They need cover to hunt. And so I thought next it would just be nice to sort of extend that context slightly to, um, to where the links used to be and where they sort of are now. And so I've taken these maps. This isn't work that I conducted, but this is um, work from a, a publication by Boyer in 2015. And I just thought they were useful. Sorry if they're a bit pixelated on your screen, but they're just a bit useful to kind of show where links used to be historically, which on the left hand panel, if we start there with the blue, the historical range will be the very light blue there and sort of note that the UK was included in that range. 
Then by the 1800s, if we look at sort of slightly darker blue shading there, we can see that the range has contracted, moved outside of, Europe, outside of uh, the UK and across um, mainland Europe. And then by sort of 1980, the estimates of their range had really contracted even further, which was the dark blue color there. And then if we flick over to the right hand side where we see the orange uh, and the, uh, the red just there, these are kind of estimates. Again, this, this data is slightly out of date now. This was published in 2015, but it gives a bit of an indication of where the um, sort of sporadic occurrence are where they're occasionally seen and when they're thought to be more permanent, which is the orange is the sporadic and the red is the slightly more permanent ranges of them. So really this is just to give an indication that they used to be widespread across Europe and their range has sort of significantly contracted over the years. Uh, and really to highlight that they used to be in the UK, but, but alas, no more. And so the next logical question, I think, is, well, where did all the links go? And in a UK context, um, some work done by David Hetherington, who I'm sure many of you will have recognised his name. He's an incredible public speaker and an incredibly competent ecologist, very, very well read on links ecology. In fact, he did his doctoral thesis on this subject. And he published a paper that um, sort of started to highlight where we think they sort of went missing from the UK landscape and what some of the drivers of them disappearing from the landscape might have been. So it's generally thought to be around the early medieval period they went extinct in the UK. Uh, and this is as a result of direct persecution, so mainly from hunting, uh, but also from indirect causes, from habitat loss, so the loss of a great deal of the forests um, over the, sort of the last couple of centuries, uh, and then prey scarcity. So it's, it might be slightly hard to believe now. We used to have um, very, very, well, the amount of deer we have in the landscape now can be sort of hard to believe, but there was sort of some prey scarcity due to competing, um, sort of competing hunting with people for deer. And so this sort of leads us on to some of the arguments that maybe why we might want to reintroduce um, the links to the UK. And as I said, I've tried to, I've sort of selected a few of the sort of bigger arguments for and against to discuss here, and I've tried to give a reasonably balanced view of them. Um, so I think starting at the very top, uh, the UK government is obliged to national and international obligations to consider reintroduction. And the key word there is consider. Um, and this comes from things like the Habitats Directive from the IUCN and in Scotland, um, we're quite proud to have the Scottish Code for Translocations, uh, which is, as far as I'm led to believe, a document that's really pushing forward um, as an international player, as setting the sort of international standard. And so one of the things, sort of a conversational topic to expand around these obligations to consider species that were previously present but have recently gone extinct and, and obviously populations could, a reintroduction would be possible, for example, hypothetically, is the IACN specifies that the pressures that led to that extinction in the first place need to no longer be present. And this seems like a fairly obvious one, right? So, for example, if persecution was the reason that the links went extinct, for example, then you need to be reasonably confident that persecution was not going to continue to lead to a subsequent extinction post reintroduction again if you were to try to proceed. And, you know, this all sort of makes a great deal of sense, I think. So, this is the big one I think you often hear talked about. Um, and so, the restoration are key ecological processes from reintroducing a top order carnivore like the lynx. And so, to sort of expand on this a little bit, um, three key points I think are linked to this that I've chosen to highlight here. It's predator-prey dynamics, trophic cascades and habitat regeneration and I'll pop each one of these in turn. So by predator-prey dynamics what we kind of mean is that when you have a predator in a system it shifts and changes the behaviour of prey species in the same way that the existence of prey in a landscape may change the behaviour of a predator. And so Many people will be aware of the Yellowstone example where they reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone National Park. I think many people have probably heard of this example. And the idea here being that when they reintroduce wolves, um, it changed the behaviour uh, of the, the elk and they moved up the landscape and it created what's sometimes referred to as this landscape of fear, where they, they changed their behaviour to try to limit the amount of exposure they had to predators in vulnerable areas of the landscape. So they moved from the lowlands sort of up the sides of the valleys. And the product of that is supposedly that the change in behaviour meant that the forest in the lowlands was able to regenerate and that obviously restored key functional processes within that ecosystem. And this is kind of linked to this idea of trophic cascades, which is effectively um, where you remove uh, or add a predator in at the top of a food chain and it has a cascade of implications down the food chain. So you can imagine if you, what has happened where we've removed lynx and wolves and those top order predators from the food chain on our island here, there's no top-down regulatory predators keeping the prey numbers in check. 
And so what we see is a really exponential growth of those prey. So, if, for example, the, the really large growth in deer numbers that kind of goes un, naturally unregulated in the UK. So similarly, the argument is that if you reinstate those top order predators, it kind of creates a new equilibrium where it brings down sort of and keeps a, a kind of a cap on the number of deer that are, or the prey species that the sort of um, the growth keeps the growth under control. So interestingly, there's not actually as much evidence as you might imagine um, for the uh, for, for the Yellowstone example. Um, the, some of it has been shown, but it's not been shown in it's not been replicated in other systems as much as you might imagine. For it, considering the amount of weight, it's often given in discussions. Terrific cascades argument is a fairly well established principle in ecology, so that is very much something that would, that would likely happen. But a caveat that's worth exploring here, I think, is that, as I mentioned earlier, they're very much roe deer specialists linked. And roe deer are one species that we have in Scotland, but obviously red deer are another species. And so red deer are much bigger than roe deer. And any impact that lynx would have on deer numbers would almost exclusively be confined to roe deer. So while this trophic cascade argument is true, you know, and it would have an impact, the impact would likely to be confined to de roe deer numbers, not necessarily red deer. So it's just sort of that broader picture that's worth considering at the same time. Um, from a habitat regeneration perspective, this again is linked to the sort of deer number argument that habitat is not necessarily regenerating or, or taking the same developmental paths that it might do because of the number of deer on the landscape. So deer preferentially or graze particular plant species and they certainly eat young trees. And so the idea is that sort of the regenerating forest is not being allowed to get away because the deer are sort of been munching away on the young trees and possibly causing novel trajectories of, of vegetation to develop because they sort of eat away particular plants and that gives room for all the other ones to fill that gap. There's also an economic argument, I think, that's sometimes posed, though not, often as, uh, not as often as the ecological process argument. Uh, and again, this is normally linked to deer control. Um, so nine million pounds worth, I found a figure the other day of damage to crops and young trees annually. Uh, and deer are also involved in 75,000 road traffic accidents a year. So one of the sort of slightly looser arguments, in my opinion, I think, is that if you bring deer numbers down, you possibly would see less uh, road traffic accidents and less damage to young crops and trees. But again, I think that has to be contextualized within the impact that road that, um, links would have only on one deer species, the roe deer not necessarily the red deer. And so to give a balanced argument, it's really fair and essential to give um, sort of the other side of the coin um, equal ear. And I think that the one that won't come as much of a shock is the concern about the risk, potential risk to livestock, um, the reintroduction of lynx might have. And particularly, this is uh, concerns about the predation of sheep. So this is an interesting point, and there, it's not, I don't think it's really a defensible point to say that no, um, no predation would occur. I think it's a re there is a risk to livestock there, uh, and it is seen elsewhere in Europe. However, I think it's also again worth reflecting on the relevance of the studies that are often cited uh, sort of as the risk to sheep. Uh, and often Norwegian studies are cited because they have particularly high levels of predation uh, of sheep from lynx relative to elsewhere in Europe. However, the way that Norway, and I'm not an expert in this, but the way that Norway farm sheep is, is slightly different to how we do it here in Scotland, and sheep are generally allowed to roam within the woodlands. Obviously, we've mentioned earlier that uh, lynx are a, a, an ambush predator that live in the woods, and so this naturally will increase the risk of predation of sheep that are in the habitat within, it, within which lynx are hunting. In contrast, we do a lot of open uh, hill sheep farming in Scotland and here in the UK, and because they require, because lynx require the, uh, the habitat and the forest cover in order to ambush prey, it is possible that we probably wouldn't see the same level of predation that's seen in Norway. That said, I think it's really important to recognise that these are genuine concerns from the farming community. And because they are genuine concerns, they deserve to be heard. And I think mistakes have been made in the past with not giving people the chance to voice those concerns. And I think really in Norway, for example, they even have compensatory mechanisms that enable people to then uh, that enable um, uh, these kind of losses of livestock to be mitigated and sort of they work with the farmers. And I think that's really the point here that we, this really promotes a discussion and an, and an open and respectful debate with people that have legitimate concerns. The next point that I think is of an interesting one is, is the landscape still suitable? Uh, and again, I think this is a really good counter argument. For example, um, the quality and the amount of UK habitat is very different today to when lynx were previously present. 
uh, this is very, very good point. And part of the loss, is, one of the reasons that we lost links from the landscape initially was due to the loss of sort of suitable quality habitat. And so we really do have to ask the very serious question of just because it was here before, today is very different from, from the time that we had before in the landscape that they lived in before. So is the landscape of today suitable for a reintroduction of this particular species? And we'll come on to that in a little bit more detail because that's something that we really tried to look into in detail in our research. Uh, and then I think another valid sort of argument that's often sort of raised, or, or maybe just a concern, I should say, is what are the risks to other wildlife? Uh, and could this potentially be diverting valuable and limited conservation funds away from uh, sort of you know, projects that could be helping existing species in the UK that are already under threat, that are already struggling? And I've certainly heard the argument, why would we reintroduce a species that's been long gone from this landscape when we could be trying to save others that are still of importance and here? I think these are all reasonable concerns. Um, from the risks of predation to other wildlife, already mentioned, I won't go over it too much again, but they're roe deer specialists. So they will occasionally take other species, but I believe there was a study, uh, so it's quite an old study now from the 90s, but they looked at nearly 1,500 sort of kills, if you like, from, um, from lynx, and only one capercaillie was taken and three foxes, I think. And so it really is true that they're the very dominant proportion of their diet is made up of roe deer. And in a landscape such as Scotland, where that prey is not limited, certainly not limited for roe deer in Scotland, it's unlikely that they would target other prey preferentially over roe deer. So then it's probably useful to reflect on what we do actually know. Uh, and I think, I think it's fair to say that uh, from, from different aspects of society, there certainly is an appetite for reintroduction. But it's also fair to say that public opinion seems pretty divided on this. There are concerns about the impact that a reintroduction might have, but no one's really done an impact assessment to see what that sort of whether those concerns are founded or how we might get around them or how they might, you know, what, what's legitimate about a reintroduction. Um, and they're sort of uncertain as to it's uncertain as to whether current UK habitat or Scotland's habitat uh, is actually sufficient to support links. Um, but no one's really done a contemporary landscape scale assessment. Uh, and I say contemporary because again, David did a lot of work uh, during his doctoral thesis. Uh, but as you'll know, landscapes are pretty dynamic. There is a forest dwelling species and forests come and go. We have short ro rotation forestry on operation in this country, um, particularly with Clearfell. And so it's even 30 years is quite a long time. And some of the data sets that we used in that original study were from the 80s. And so if there really is sort of a, a, a need for an updated understanding of whether the UK or Scotland is, is suitable for a reintroduction. On top of that, we have sort of advances in ecological theory and, and modeling approaches that enable us to have tools at our disposal now that we didn't previously. And again, that's something I'll touch on in a little bit detail, more detail throughout the talk. So the next question I think is what do we need? Uh, if we, and I think the first thing to reflect on uh, is that reintroductions inherently are complex, they are costly, and they take an incredibly long time. And this has never been more true than it is for large carnivores. Uh, when I say a long time, I mean it can take upwards of 100 years to know if your reintroduction has been successful. And that's because these can sometimes be very slow to reproduce these animals, and you need to reach a particular number within a population. This is simplified, but in order to know whether they have reached a stable sort of reproductive population that can sustain itself. Uh, and I think because of this, it's quite clear that really we need evidence to make uh, effective decisions. And in order to collect that evidence, we need tools that allow us to explore different scenarios. And these tools need to be allow, enable us to do it quickly, safely and inexpensively, especially relative to the costs and the complexities of actually performing a reintroduction. It makes sense to put the groundwork in first to make the sort of these decisions as, um, as, a, as effectively as possible. And so hopefully this is where we've come in and we want to try and sort of shed some light on some of these questions. And I really wanted to put this picture in here, partly because it's one of my favourite places in Scotland and bonus points for anyone that knows where it is. Um, but partly also because it's the sort of habitat that if we were to reintroduce links, they would be dwelling in. And so to move into the kind of the research side of things, so the science that I've really been involved in developing, um, we had four really sort of key research aims initially. The first was very simply to sort of answer the question of if there was enough suitable habitat in Scotland to support a reintroduction. Uh, which potential relief sites might be best. So some candidate sites had already been identified, but we needed to sort of be able to work out which ones might be useful or what might be best suited to a reintroduction, because we couldn't, for example, in reality, afford to reintroduce from all three sites. 
uh, we needed to sort of work out or we wanted to understand if there were distinct habitat networks across Scotland and critically whether there are any barriers to movement or dispersal of these particular or the population establishing once reintroduction had occurred. And finally, we kind of wanted to develop a tool that could not just be applied to the reintroduction of links to Scotland, but could also be used for the conservation planning of other species. And so this is kind of the, this is the journey that I set out on for my masters. And our approach was reasonably simple and I've tried to break it down um, sort of as best I can here. But in effect, we needed to first identify a suitable computer model that enabled us to answer these questions. Then we needed to map the Scottish landscape so we got a firm understanding at high spatial resolution about what the landscape looks like from a links perspective. Then we needed to get a bit of an understanding about what the sort of spatial extent and location of all the actual suitable habitat for a lynx might be. Then we needed to do a really broad literature review to capture as much information about the biology and the ecology of this particular species as we, as we could. And then the idea was to feed these maps and all of this information from the literature into a model and that then enabled us to run some simulations so that we could then explore these questions and hopefully get some traction, get some answers and some evidence to sort of inform these decisions. And so just to focus in on each of these elements in turn, that the landscape map, and this is actually the landscape map that we use across Scotland. Uh, and it's quite amazing that the resolution of data that's available now. So this map actually represents every 25 metres by 25 metres across all of Scotland is represented by a habitat. Um, and so we need to kind of simplify this a little bit to make it A, tractable, but B, from sort of like a links perspective. Uh, and so first of all, we really included all major road networks. And this is important because we know from other studies in Europe that roads are particular barriers to links movement and dispersal, but they're also major causes of mortality. So two things that you'd really want to take into consideration if you were modeling a reintroduction. Then we sort of took all of those far more habitats than are listed here. We took all of those habitats and we aggregated them into ones that were perceptually similar to, to sort of to, um, from a lynx perspective. So, for example, I don't think a lynx would be particularly worried if it's going through acid grassland or calcareous grassland. So we sort of lumped them together as grassland. From a lynx perspective, they're very similar. And this left us with 14 distinct habitat types. And this map was going to be important because it provides the kind of landscape over which we, we could then um, simulate the movement of individual links across. And this is important because you think that actually grassland might be easier to move through than fresh water, and maybe forest might be more important habitat than grassland. And being able to capture the actual habitat on the ground of Scotland as they really are now meant that we could explicitly model this and take this into account in the, in the sort of um, the model that we were building. So now we've got our sort of underlying landscape map. Now we needed to build a habitat map to sort of identify where all the actual sort of the habitat that they could use were. And we did sort of three things here. So we took into account buffers around suitable habitat, barriers that might sort of bisect and cut up suitable habitat, and then sort of identified some basic requirements that link might, links might need before we could say that's going to be a suitable patch for a link to call home. And this, this is a bit of an example of, of one patch, for example, so the woodland being the green area inside the yellow, and then we put a buffer around that green area just to sort of take into account that they probably use that area on the edge of particular woodland patches. And then we put some minimum sort of basic requirements, and this was just to make sure that we were definitely getting patches of a suitable size and quality to actually support a lynx home range, to make it realistic. And so, for example, we put into place criteria where we only included patches as suitable for lynx home ranges that are above 45 square kilometres, kilometres squared, sorry, as continuous habitat. They had to have a minimum woodland component of greater than 24 uh, kilometres squared, and there needed, to, there needed to be a reasonable amount of forest cover, so we chose 38%. And again, this was informed by literature that we sort of had seen with lynx studies elsewhere. And so all this kind of came together and we have 53 patches across Scotland, which is what you're actually seeing there. So they're the actual shape, size and distribution of the suitable habitat patches across Scotland. That if a lynx landed in there, it might think that's, that's reasonable, I'll call that home. And so then we kind of needed to select our model. Uh, and so the actual name of the model isn't too important, but it does have some, some qualities that we'll explore that make it particularly suitable and really interesting with the, the complexity with which can be incorporated. And so we've got our landscape map and we've got our habitat map and we can feed those into our model. So that's great. We've got that component sorted. And so the next part was the literature review that we needed to do to really capture all of this information about the actual species itself so that we could be reasonably confident that we were setting parameters and values within our model that would actually represent how links would really behave in this landscape. 
And so this model is spatially explicit, which is just a fancy way of saying that it actually takes into account the space and the landscape around it. We were able to capture real, the way that this species actually moves across different habitats. Critically, and I think this is a really important point, that every individual within our model was treated as an individual. It wasn't a deterministic process, so to speak. So every individual didn't always behave as every other individual did. There was randomness built into the system. And this allowed us to really reflect reality in a lot more detail. So each individual behaves in its own quirky sort of ways, although constrained within certain parameters. We included demographic data as well. So this is things like births and death rates, just to make it again accurate to the particular species. And crucially, we were able to capture dispersal. And this is where one of the strengths of this particular model was. And by dispersal, I mean, there's, there's three distinct phases of dispersal. You can imagine leaving your hometown, then you have this sort of phase of exploration where you're trying to find somewhere where you might want to settle down. And then the third phase is actually settling in your home patch. And so we can cap these three phases in ecology are quite distinct and there's distinct pressures associated with each phase. We're able to capture that realistically in our model. And so we fed that into the model too. And at this point, you're probably thinking, so what does the model actually do? And that's a fair question, I think. And I've tried to think about how to summarize this uh, as best I can, but in effect, running a model like this enables us to take real data that we know about the particular species, take all of the ecological theory and how we understand species to move, how they interact with the landscape, and take a real landscape as we know it to exist on the ground, combine it all together, and then run simulations. And we hit play, basically, and we see what happens. And then it allows us to run multiple simulations. And then over the course of multiple simulations, we can build up a more comprehensive picture about what would likely happen in reality. So we get an average, effectively. And I just want to dig into sort of the details a little bit more about why this is so powerful. And I think sex is a nice place to start. So if you imagine a population of lynx, and excellent, the lynx has been born in our population, hooray. And this lynx happens to be female. Uh, and in reality, in the wild, as we know from literature and other studies, we know that when the female lynx is born, it has a 40% chance of leaving its sort of home range and setting off into the world and setting up its own kind of, um, its own home range, so to speak. But when it's looking for its own home range, it has certain criteria that it's looking to fulfill. And so, for example, it might be looking for a suitable area of habitat, might be big enough. And it also might be sort of looking for an area that doesn't have too many other links. And if it finds this, it says, OK, fair enough, I've settled here. That's home for me. But not every, every lynx that's born in a population is going to be female. What if the lynx that's born in the population was instead a male? And we know from the literature, and again, these same studies of, of wild populations of lynx, that actually males are far more likely to leave their home territory. And so it's important to capture, capture this nuance because we have more, more males leaving their home territory than we have females leaving their home territory. And when they get, uh, when they're sort of exploring this landscape, maybe they have different criteria. Maybe they're after different things from life. And maybe they're after similar things. And so, for example, a male might still be looking for a suitable habitat and not too many other lynx in the surrounding area but a criteria that a male might be looking for in an area is to have a female present. And then if it finds all of these criteria, it might also choose to settle. And so what I'm hoping this slide is kind of just showing in a simplified version is that actually there's a lot of complexity already in just whether it's a male or a female that's born in a population. And being able to capture that complexity and incorporate it into how we're understanding our simulations to run is really important for getting reliable estimates of what might happen if a reintroduction goes ahead. And so a second example of this is the different life stages. And just like us, you know, you're born and then you go through teenage years and then you sort of progress into the adult years. Uh, lynx have exactly the same thing. And so we have, they have kittens and then they have sort of a sub-adult sort of juvenile phase. And then eventually they become adults. And so we might want to keep some things reasonably constant in our model. So, for example, the birth rate across a population of lynx is likely to be reasonably consistent. It's always going to be between sort of one and four kittens. You're not going to have a lynx having 400 kittens in, in one year. It's just un unreasonable. But we really want to know from a reintroduction perspective how, how things progress over time. And that's one of the key things when you're looking over 100 years, for example, is you really need to know how a population is likely to develop, how it's likely to spread across a landscape, how it's likely to sort of, how many individuals is likely to be in that population over time. But equally, it's important to know how, um, how much sort of likelihood of surviving there is if you're an adult or if you're a juvenile or if you're a kitten. 
And in reality, what we find is adults are far more likely to survive than, for example, sub-adults. In the same way that sub-adults or sort of juveniles are far, far more likely to survive than juveniles. Uh, and that's kind of obvious if you think about it. An adult, very experienced, knows how to hunt, can provide for itself. A juvenile, just finding its way in the world, maybe finds it a little bit more difficult to survive. And uh, a juvenile, for, sorry, so about now, a juvenile, obviously is a kitten, highly dependent on its parents, very sort of prone to exposure and sort of death in those early years. And so being able to capture these, not just these different chances of surviving if you're at a different stage in your life, but also as each individual grows up in the population in our model, we can, we can move it between these different life stages and then apply the different sort of chances of survival that you might be exposed to if you're an adult versus a sub-adult. And so that's a lot of detail, and I'm really sorry if it's a little bit too detailed, but I, I really just wanted to get across quite how much complexity and sort of ecological understanding about how organisms develop and how they move across a landscape can be incorporated into these models and, and that we're using to inform decisions. And so that's the, that's the detailed bit there. Now we get to move on to the, the interesting bit, which is where, where do you want to actually reintroduce links if, if you were hypothetically considering it? So here's our habitat map of Scotland, and you'll see that three patches there are highlighted in red. So these three patches were previously identified by a piece of work that we weren't involved in as being potential candidate sites. And you've got one in Aberdeenshire just there, you've got one on the Kintyre Peninsula, and you've got one in Kilda Forest. So those three patches highlighted in red, uh, sort of blown up to a larger scale there, are actually the, um, the patches that we decided to sort of compare and model a reintroduction from and see how they performed relative to one another. But before obviously we could um, compare them, we needed to sort of get a grapple on how we were actually gonna measure success. Always quite nice before you start anything. Um, and so very simply, the first question we wanted to ask was what was the risk of extinction? Was there a greater risk that if you introduce links to any of those categories, in it, to any of those sites, sorry, that one would be more likely to go extinct than the other? We wanted to know what the, uh, whether, um, what the chance the population exists after 100 years. Uh, we wanted to know how much of the suitable habitat was actually being used by the links once they'd been reintroduced from these different locations. We kind of wanted to know how many individuals would be in the population over time, but particularly at the end of our study period. And we wanted to know how quickly the population spread across the landscape and how it spread across the landscape. And so we were hoping that these measures would give us a, a kind of a nice firm way of comparing the relative suitability of these three potential reintroduction sites. And so now we're getting into the nitty gritty of like what we actually found. Uh, and so for each site, we, we took 10 adult links and we had five male, five female, very important. There's a funny anecdote actually of where reintroduction planning wasn't done with links studies particularly. Uh, and uh, they introduced, I think it was, I think they reintroduced two links and it turned out that both of them ended up being male. So you can see how some things <laughs> that should be caught at the planning stage uh, aren't always. So it's important to sort of think things through. Um, and so we basically took these 10 adult links, five male, five female, and then we ran a simulation for 100 years. We ran 100 simulations from each of these reintroduction sites, and then we did some testing just to make sure that the result we were seeing uh, was sort of what we might expect. And I promise you this is the only graph I'll show you throughout the, throughout the slides, but I, I couldn't honestly say I'm a scientist without trying to fit a graph in. And so the, all I want you to take away from this graph really is that there's three distinct lines here, the blue, red, and green ones. And each one of those rela relates to the extinction probability of the different reintroduction sites. So on the vertical axis, the, the y-axis there, that's, the, that's just the probability of the population going extinct. And the x-axis along the bottom is just, the prob uh, it's just time, basically. And all you really need to see here is that the blue and the red lines are both quite high. So over time, there's quite a high chance that the population will go extinct. But the green line is much lower than those other two lines. And that basically indicates that in the Kintyre Peninsula, which is the green line, there's a much, much, much lower probability that the population would go extinct if we reintroduced it there. And so if we look at the, the for reintroduction sites in a little bit more detail, and I hope you can see these maps, they were intended to be on a projector, so apologies if they're not particularly clear on a small screen. But what, what, this is, what this map is showing is the reintroduction from Kilda Forest as it was modeled. And this is showing the spread of the population of lynx after we reintroduce them. So that sort of red patch which has been enlarged just there, that's where we released the links hypothetically in our simulation. And the lighter colors show where the, where the links reached immediately. So one to 20 years are the light kind of sandy colors. And as the colors get cooler in that map, it took longer for the links to move across the landscape to inhabit and occupy that available habitat. 
And the thing I want you to really notice here is that in the north of the country where it's really dark purple, that represents habitat that no lynx ever reached in any simulation. And that's kind of important. And you'll notice that a lot of, um, a lot of that habitat is on the, the sort of north side of the central belt there. And we'll come back to that in a little bit as to why that's important. So the Kielder Forest reintroduction, only modelled when we modelled it, has an average of 21% chance of reintroduction success. There was only 19% of all the habitat that was available in Scotland was ever actually occupied by any lynx. And we started with 10 lynx and we only ended up with 55 in the population at the end. And so I think what I hope this sort of shows is that actually Kielder Forest, which was very seriously being considered as a reintroduction site, when we modelled it and incorporated all that complexity, only gave us a 21% chance that any reintroduction there would succeed. And I think that's quite a salient point because it really starts to show how actually that's incredibly low and nobody would really be able to justify reintroduction if you said to them that, oh, there's only a 20% chance it's going to actually work. But of course, we wanted to compare this between the different reintroduction sites. So we also looked at Aberdeenshire, which is our site that we enlarged here. And again, this sort of heat map shows from the, ye the yellowy colours, the patches of habitat that the lynx reached very quickly once we reintroduced them in Aberdeenshire. And then going across to the cooler patches in the blue sort of end of the spectrum, how long it took for them to reach those habitat patches. And again, you'll see here that this reintroduction site was sort of more above the central belt, but that dark purple colour below the central belt, below sort of Glasgow there, means that no links again ever reached the other side of the central belt from where we sort of modelled a reintroduction. And so Aberdeenshire, slightly better chance of success, 35% chance of reintroduction success here, um, and 36% of the available habitat in Scotland uh, was occupied which again isn't really very good. I mean, effectively you imagine this is after a hundred years. So we've run our simulation for a hundred years and even after a hundred years, only 35, 36% of all the habitat in Scotland is actually being used by a lynx. And there's only a 35% chance that after a hundred years, that population would even still be there. And on top of this, we have 98 lynx in the population. So a much healthier number of lynx than there was in Kilda Forest but still, we're still needing a few more than that to get to what would be classed as maybe a genetically viable population size. And so the last of our three sites that we wanted to look at, the Kintyre Peninsula, we have a look here, There's a, this is the same heat ramp again, so lighter colours sort of in this sort of sandy kind of green area of the spectrum are patches that were reached first following the introduction, and you can see that spread across the highlands there towards Aberdeenshire, and again very little of those patches and that um, in the southern uplands down in the sort of uh, below the central belt are actually showing any signs of occupancy of a lynx over a hundred years. And so here's our patch, but the Kintyre Peninsula actually gave an 83% chance that this reintroduction would succeed. And so this is kind of this is kind of a bit of a game changer. So it's not, it's certainly not something that you would want to write home about and throw all your eggs in one basket, rush out and reintroduce lynx, but it certainly does give a sort of a, a, a tantalizing prospect that a reintroduction from this part of Scotland might have a reasonable chance of, of sort of surviving in the long term. Equally, after 100 years, half of the habitat in all of Scotland was being used by lynx. And actually, we ended up with 150 lynx in the population. So we've turned 10 lynx into 150 lynx over 100 years. And that's starting to get a lot more towards the size of population we would expect to see as sort of stable genetically um, in, uh, across Scotland. There's obviously other factors included in there where you might need to sort of add extra lynx in to enrich the genetic pool over time but it's certainly a more encouraging picture than the other two reintroduction sites have suggested. And so if we consider these sort of three different reintroduction sites collectively, just ignore the letters there, sorry they were left over from a manuscript, I hope what's clear is that there's a ranking of suitability between the three sites and that's effectively what we set out to do, it was to build a tool that enabled us to assess the, re assess the relative suitability of potential reintroduction sites quickly, safely and cheaply basically. So if we just go back to sort of what we aimed to do at the start of the study, we, the first question we wanted to know was whether there was enough suitable habitat in Scotland. And I think it's fair to say that yes, it does look like there is enough suitable habitat in Scotland, but it only appears that the majority of this is in the Highlands. And I'll come on to why that's sort of important again in a second on, on point three. Uh, we wanted to see whether we could identify if there was sort of a, which site would be better. And of course, we only looked at three sites, but of those three sites, we could quite clearly see one site was much more suitable than the other two. That was Kintyre Peninsula. Um, and were there any distinct habitat networks or barriers? And I think this is a really interesting question and, and something I tried to highlight by that dark purple area on the maps and the central belt, um, sort of seemingly blocking the movement of, uh, of links across the landscape. 
And I think it's quite clear from, certainly from my perspective in this, from this modeling, that the, the central belt provides a really solid barrier. They, the links really struggle to cross that barrier successfully. And I think what this kind of highlights is that it's, it's not enough to say we have X amount of habitat in Scotland, therefore it is suitable for a reintroduction. It's the connectivity of that landscape that also really matters. And so while you need enough habitat, it also needs to be adequately connected for it to be actually useful, if that makes sense. And so with all of the highlands being effectively sort of isolated from all of the, the southern uplands and down in the Kilda Forest area, all that habitat becomes effectively useless to the lynx, depending on which side you reintroduce them. I think that's a really important point that came out of what we were doing and sort of definitely reaffirmed some of the work that David did a few years back. Uh, and we also wanted to develop these tools that could be used for other species. And I think what we kind of demonstrated was that this kind of modeling framework, it's, it's quick and it's safe and it's inexpensive. I mean, this was my master's work, so technically it costs no one anything other than me. Um, and it really allows for us to explore alternative management scenarios, different reintroduction sites, and could feasibly be applied to many different species. And so just to kind of sum up what I've been talking about this evening, I appreciate it's a lot of information, but I hope it was reasonably digestible. Scotland does appear to be ecologically suitable and by ecologically suitable I mean that it appears from our modelling study and there would need to be more work on this that there is a sufficient amount of interconnected habitat in Scotland but and I can't stress this enough this this study is a single piece of an incredibly complex jigsaw and I really can't overstate how much this is just a single piece of evidence that informs a much wider debate and this sort of much larger complex jigsaw of decision making around a reintroduction is composed of social, ecological, economic, political aspects. And none of this, this decision cannot be made by only considering one of these elements. And there are others, of course, I've just chosen some of the big ones that I think are, are particularly important. No, no reintroduction decision can be made without being sort of informed on all of these other components. I read a really interesting uh, paper a few years back now, and. The author made the point of saying that actually to them the most important point of any reintroduction was the social component and the more sort of work I've done on this the more I've come to really understand that why that's true and I think you know if you cannot get people on board or people do not want to see it happen then there really is no point in going ahead with it and so this polarity that we have in the debate as to whether we should or shouldn't do it really needs to be resolved before we can kind of push forward and ultimately that's that's just a very logical stance from my perspective we discussed at the start how actually persecution was one of the major causes of links leaving the uk or, or you know being being lost from the uk and so were a reintroduction to go ahead but people were still particularly you know didn't want to see it happen that would likely lead to like widespread persecution and that would thus obviously lead to a reintroduction failure so just kind of to exemplify the point that even though the landscape might be suitable it looks like it's sufficiently connected if we don't kind of get all of these aspects of the equation right then it's really it's really sort of not worth proceeding with and so this question is the one that i always get asked and so it's probably reasonable to try and finish around it so should we reintroduce links to scotland and personally i actually think this is the wrong question i think really the question we should be asking is is there enough evidence to make an effective and informed decision and maybe this is a my opinion on it is that we're not there yet. I don't think we have enough of those other pieces of the puzzle to make an informed decision uh, as to whether we should go ahead and do it or not. But I think this is probably quite a nice comment just to leave at the end to stimulate a little bit of debate. So uh, special thanks to all of these amazing people. As with all science, it's never one person. It only ever happens because of a collective team of people that bring it all together. And this project certainly wouldn't have happened with all the, without all these fantastic people. So thanks very much to, to these wonderful people. And thanks to you all for listening and uh, thanks for your attention and I'll take any questions.